This is Josiah Plays Torment, Tides of Numenera. I cannot tell you how excited I am right now because I have been waiting for this for so long. I backed this on Kickstarter way back in April of 2013. That has been almost four years. And I backed this to a large sum of money for myself. Much more than I've ever backed any other game or project on Kickstarter. More than I should have, more than I could afford. I backed it to a, to a large sum because I so believed in it and so wanted this game. Why? Because Planescape Torment, the game that this is ostensibly the spiritual sequel to, or the spiritual successor, rather not really a sequel because it doesn't play, take place in the same setting per se, it doesn't take place with the same characters per se, but it has the same, the same design philosophy behind it. It has the same tones and themes and attention to writing. And, and strange setting and strange characters and lots and lots and lots of dialogue and descriptive text. And those are the things that made the original Planescape Torment so great. But Planescape Torment was and is my favorite game of all time. I've never loved a game as much as I've loved Planescape Torment. And so when I heard they were going to try to make a, a spiritual successor to it, carrying forward the Torment name in a new game, with similar design principles, I got so excited and I had to throw as much money as I possibly could at it. And now, all these years later, finally the game is out. Yes, Fry Guy, good to see ya. How you doing, Fry Guy? T yes, the game is out. This is the full, final retail release. And it's, uh, it's ready to play. It's ready to play and I am ready to play it. So... I'm going to be giving away some copies of the game today. I ended up with a few extra digital copies as part of my backer rewards. Four of them, actually. I actually ended up getting six copies of the game. I have the copy that I'm playing right now, which is an upgrade from my beta of the game. They're sending me a physical boxed copy. So that's two copies for me. Plus, I have four extra digital copies that I'm going to give away on stream over the course of the next many hours that I play this. So, anyway, I think it's time to start. It's time to start. Give me one moment here. I need to blow my nose. And I should probably mute my mic for that. Hold on. Okay, I'm back, and I'm ready to go. So with no further ado, I'm just going to start the game. Now, I should say that this is a mostly blind playthrough. Most of the game I know nothing about. I've obviously never played it before because it just came out. However, there was a beta, which was released uh, many, many months ago, which offered a small sliver of the beginning part of the game, and I did play that. So I do have some knowledge about the early, early part of the game, although I've forgotten most of it because it was many months ago when I played the beta. But then all the rest of the game beyond that I, have no I know nothing about, so this is a mostly blind playthrough. I'd say 90% blind. Frog, are you waiting till you have more free time to play Tyranny? How will I find time to play this too? I know, right? It's tough, isn't it? There's too many games, too many good games to play. And just not enough time to get to them all. There's, I have a huge list of games that I still want to play. That I have not yet played. Some of which are like years old. Many years now. So, it's crazy. And I have a lot of free time to play games. Unlike some people. Alright. I can't load a game because there is no game. I have to just start new. I've gone in here and I've set up my options. I've set up my sound settings and everything. I think... I think all my options are how I want them. I may adjust a couple of things. Um, but basically, it's good to go. 
I think it's good to go. So, starting. Let's do this. Heavy and medium armor inflicts a penalty on your might and speed stat pools while equipped. Will you be female or male? I think for this one, I think I'm going to go female. We're going to be a female last cast off. In Planescape Torment, you play a character called the Nameless One. You don't get to name your character. You don't get to choose your gender or anything. In this, you, you similarly play a certain defined character called the Last Cast Off. You don't get to name your character, but you do get to pick whether you want to be a female or male Last Cast Off. I'm going to go with female. I like female protagonists, for the most part. Your mind wakes in darkness. Aching cold sets into an unfamiliar body. A distant howling surrounds you. Louder with each passing second. Insistent and invisible hands slap and tear at the membrane that protects you. This is an interesting way to start a game. We're apparently falling. Your first emotion is an involuntary and formless panic. You feel you have forgotten something. Something important. As if it once meant the world to you. But the details slip away as you grasp at them. What have we forgotten? You force your eyes open. I will look at this body. It said it was an unfamiliar body. The body is... Wait, you are wearing a form-fitting suit of some dark material. You recall that you were wearing something much more elaborate a short time ago. You have smooth, light brown skin, five fingers on each hand, five toes on each foot. Good muscles, strong but not bulky, and slim hips. Your palms are soft, as if they have not done much labor, but scars and burns on the hands and wrists suggest that you haven't always been careful. Why can't you remember this? Scars and burns. Interesting. Who are we? Without warning, the cocoon that surrounds you shreds and tears away. You are falling. Above you, a small moon is slowly collapsing in on itself. The world is many kilometers below you. Alright, we can look at the horizon. We can flatten out to catch the wind. We can try to judge how far it is to the ground. Or we can dive toward the ground. I happen to know that if you make certain choices in this beginning part, that you can literally die and lose the game in this beginning little thing right here. <laughs> so I'm not going to dive toward the ground. I'm going to look at the horizon. You are spinning too rapidly to get a good look. You can see a large landmass, a vast body of water directly below you, and scattered archipelagos, but the detail eludes you. A deep black night is above you, its nocturnal clarity disappearing as the haze of atmosphere envelops you. I'm going to try to remember what happened. It's... it's hazy. You were in a tall passageway, its sides slicked with dew, the air warm and moist, as if you were caught in the breath of a giant organism. You remember fleeing in fear and exhilaration, laughing through the terror. Was it that pursued you? This sounds interesting. So we were inside some sort of maybe giant living thing? In space, I guess? I don't know. Running away from something. Having a good time, though. Something ancient and cold. Its coiling power, the promise of oblivion. Its shadowed tendrils struck at you, and the walls where they landed were torn apart utterly, destroyed beyond any hope of repair. You leapt into a membranous cocoon and fell from the, the station, the moon, and then you were empty. But who were you? What was that creature? A word surfaces in your thoughts, and you seize it before it vanishes. Sorrow. The world fills your sight. You're about to hit. 
So we were on the moon, maybe, or inside the moon. Being chased by something called sorrow. Alright, we've got some good writing so far. What am I going to do? I want to try to remember the sorrow. It hurts your mind to recall, but you push past it. A creature of the forgotten world seeking you out across the centuries. But it's not you it seeks, is it? It sought the man whose memories you shovel through now. And you realize suddenly that you are not him. Creature of a forgotten world. You were... Who? Who were you? I'm gonna continue to search these memories. Did you somehow manage to sidestep everything you know about anatomy, physics, and death? And you were surprised to realize that you do know something about them. And you survived this fall. You suspect that you might be able to reawaken a dormant strength you sense inside you. But who could possibly survive a fall from this height? Indeed. You remember reaching an escape tube, and you remember being struck by a tendril of force, and then the fall. The fall. You open your eyes in time to see a riot of color around you, your descent barely slowed, and then agony flares throughout your body as a crunching impact destroys you. The last thing you hear is a rapidly cycling whine of energy, and then... So, a crunching impact destroys you. So I think we've already been destroyed. All right, good game. That was fun. 10 out of 10. Darkness. Now we're waking up in some very strange place. Very strange place indeed. All right, let's see if I can zoom out a bit here. I can. Okay. Very dark in here. Metal waves roll over the floor below, sending vibrations through the soles of your boots. This is a cool place. This thing. Jumbled thoughts cloud your head as you study the empty bowl before you. Drops of liquid fall from the ceiling, spattering on the ground next to the bowl. The light from every drop is reflected in the bowl's rounded hollow as if it hungers for that light and needs to be filled. Yet the bowl remains dry. Another drop falls from the ceiling and splashes across the pylons, wasted. So here's the UI for the conversations you can see. You can use items, ciphers, consumables, and abilities granted by equipped items. Sometimes you can use items in conversation things. Sometimes you can use character abilities. Active abilities granted by the character's type or focus. Here's a picture of our character, the last cast off. She looks like she's seen some shit. We've got might, speed, and intellect. There's our health bar. That's how much money we have, which is zero right now. I like the little... The little crawling light on the on the UI, that's pretty cool. This definitely looks a lot more polished and, and attractive than it did way back in the beta. Let's examine the bowl. You trace your fingers over the slippery, overlapping scales that spiral up from the bottom of the bowl. The sharp toothed rim plucks at your skin. It's going to be tricky to move this bowl without slicing your fingers on the edge. You might have to put some effort into it. Reflected light streaks across the surface of the bowl as another droplet falls from the ceilings. Now let's see if we can carefully move the bowl beneath the liquid. So this uses Might, which is one of our three stat pools. This is this is roughly based on the Numenera tabletop game system, with some changes. But it is set in the Numenera tabletop game setting. It's a, it's a really interesting tabletop RPG that was created by Monty Cook Games that basically takes place a billion years in the future of Earth. 
even though the world has been like destroyed and remade and there's been all these different different civilizations that have rose and fell and people have come from other worlds and other dimensions and the human race has completely left earth and then come back and like it's all mysterious what's what all has happened but it's left behind all these ruins and devices from ancient civilizations that had all this incredible technology so so incredible as to be essentially like magic to to us and the people in this in this setting in this world are just trying to like figure out how to survive and how to use that old stuff you've encountered your first task you have three stat pools might speed and intellect that you can spend to increase your chances of success this is called using effort to more easily move the bolt in front of you Use uh, left click to spend might for a higher level of effort. Don't worry if you fail in this task. In Torment, failure often results in interesting outcomes. So this shows me that I have a 60% chance, and if I click on this, it'll tell me why exactly I have a 60% chance. I get plus 15% because I investigated the bull in the basis. So I have a 60% chance. If I spend, and this is my might pool, 5. So if I click on this... I'll spend no might and I'll roll my 60%. But if I go here, see if I go here, then that means I'm spending a point of might and my chance goes up to 80. And if I go here, I'm spending two points of might and it goes up to 100%. So I'll spend one and go up to 80. See what happens. Okay, check mark. I succeeded. They've dramatically improved the UI and interface for this. Uh, UI and interface mean the same thing. UI literally stands for user interface. <laughs> They've dramatically improved it since the early beta that I played. You carefully take hold of the bowl, avoiding the teeth on the serrated rim. With a deep breath, you move it over the glowing pool of fallen light. Uh, your pools refill when you rest, Fry Guy. although there may be abilities or items that can refill your pools or restore points to your pools without resting. Oh, now the shiny liquid is in there. Drop by drop, the bowl fills. Ripples spreading over the blurred outline of your reflection. A pale blue luminescence stretches into the corners of the room. A clear radiance spills across the segmented floor, washing away the nearest shadows and pouring into your mind, melting the ragged edges of your fragmented thoughts. You are not whole, not yet, but you have begun to heal from the damage done in your long fall. A voice calls out from somewhere high above, beyond the reaches of the spreading light. Hello? Are you still alive down there? We're up here! Build a path up to us and be careful! Ah, now the pylons that are going up and down have formed a bridge to another place. It's telling me I can zoom out if I want. So... I can tell you a little bit about, since I know about this very beginning part of the game, if you fail that might check, you cut yourself on the edge of the bowl and do a point of damage to yourself, but it's kind of interesting, the blood gets into the bowl and it makes everything red in there, and the whole light, this whole room is then lit with red light instead of, instead of this white or bluish light if you, if you cut yourself, which is pretty cool. Vibrations through the soles of your... So we've got some interesting looking stuff up here. This mirror looks strange. As though what you see in it is real and you're the reflection. The lighter on the door's frame dims and flares like a roaring fire in a high wind. I wonder where these doors go to. No sign or symbol tells you what might be behind this enormous door. A dull chill radiates from its bronzed, segmented surface, and the thick metal wheel seems frozen into place. And this one? K 
Countless scratches and wounds mar the surface of this door. Someone made a great effort to get inside. To no avail. Alright, so we'll come over here. Uh, now we've got some of our, our UIs come up here. We've got the party inventory. Inspect, equip, and transfer items or equipment. Your inventory lets you view equipment and manage items and equipment you find. It has a number of sections. Versus equipment, which contains any items equipped to the current character. Equipment includes melee and ranged weapons, shields, armor, ornaments such as rings and amulets, and bonded items. Your backpack contains the items being carried by the current character. You can equip, inspect, or transfer items from it. Quest items contains any special items required for quests. Quest items cannot be discarded or sold, so you won't need to worry about accidentally losing one. The final section shows the ciphers you are carrying and your cipher limit. Basically, in Numenera, ciphers are like pieces of ancient technology from the far more technologically advanced civilizations that used to be on the planet. That we don't even know what these things used to do or what they were for. All we know is that you can pick them up and you can use them somehow to accomplish a thing. And they're one-shot items. They're kind of like potions or scrolls in a standard fantasy RPG. Each one has its own special power, and once you've used it once, it's gone. But you can only carry a few of them before they start to negatively affect you. Ciphers shown on the inner rings are highlighted in blue and are safe to carry. Those on the outer ring, highlighted in orange, are over your cipher limit and inflict negative effects as long as you're carrying them. You can use, sell, discard, or transfer them to another party member to get back under your cipher limit. And you can increase your cipher limit by depending on, you know, what skills you take or what class abilities or whatever. So the point is, you're not really allowed to hoard them. And like in most games where you just keep finding consumables and you hoard them, in this game you're supposed to get rid of them. Because if you don't get rid of them, every extra one you carry starts to hurt you and gives you penalties and stuff. So you're encouraged to, like, use them, you know, quickly, rather than just carrying them all around. Which is kind of cool. So that's the inventory. Last cast off. You are newly awakened. Your calling is unknown. Dominant tide. Idealist. In some people, no one tide dominates over any other. These people might be capricious, or they might live their lives in balance, valuing both investigation and action, power and kindness, society's good and the good of the individual. Those who continue this path are not beholden to any one ideal. They are flexible, open to a variety of solutions for each situation. Most find this is not an easy path to follow for very long. So this is kind of like the equivalent of alignment. There's not really a good and evil in this. There's the different tides, and there's like six of them. They have, each is a different color, and they represent sort of different uh, values or outlooks on life or, or, or motivations or whatever. And based on your actions and choices, your tide will change, and you'll align with one or, or the other of them. Right now, I'm not aligned with any. So right now, I have no equipment whatsoever. There's my character sheet. Currently, I have no abilities or anything. I haven't even technically done character creation yet. That's coming up. So, right now, I'm just kind of a blank slate. There's my journal, which has nothing in it as of yet. Character sheet, journal. There's a map of where we are, which is apparently called the Dark Fathom. I like how it has a little... A little legend down here showing certain things on the map, like that's where we are. It's good. Uh, and the game menu. Items, abilities. Cool. Let's click on this next thing and see what happens. I should save the game since I haven't done that yet. I think I can quick save too. It's probably F5. Yeah, F5 worked for a quick save. Alright, let's go. As soon as you touch the orb, a memory floods your mind. You stand in front of a rusted door. The air is humid and dank. You've had a moment's respite from this waterlogged hell, 
a bubble of stale air your resting point. You've breathed water before, and you've lived decades beneath the waves, but this body's an air breather, and the constant pressure has been crushing you ever so subtly. Worse, your companion's mind seems to be wandering from the task at hand. He's a genius with machines, as you well know, but now he seems... distracted. The device in his hands is covered in knobs, wires, and antennas. He believes it can get the two of you through the corroded door, but he's merely staring at it. Perhaps he's lost faith in his invention, but that is hardly your concern. This mission cannot be delayed. It must proceed. So I've got some options here. Do I can deceive him, threaten him, or cast a spell to fix the device myself? I'm thinking... I feel like deceiving him. Deceive him by telling him that you've heard sounds of pursuit. Your words echo clearly, and he looks up, surprised, as you cut through his indecisive daze. He grimaces and says, All right, we'll be through the door before they can catch up. His fingers make minute adjustments to the knobs and blinking levers of the device, and the stale air of your bubble freshens as the door swings open. A dark hallway lies beyond, a passage that links the water-bordered cells and the aquatic viewing areas. What you seek lies there. Moments later, you're underwater again, your hands closing around a strange yet familiar artifact. You need it to complete... Something. It hovers above a pedestal, rotating in the dark water. An electric current runs through your fingers as your hand crosses the vertical plane of the pedestal, and an iridescent field coalesces so fast that the wave of pressure dazes you for a moment. The rising pulse of a sonar alarm ripples through the water. The guards won't be far behind. I can run. I can disable the solar pulse. Or I can use a device to stop them, one of the ciphers in your belt. I'm going to try to disable the sonar pulse. You focus on the cloudy base of the pedestal. Your fingers instinctively find the control panel for the jeweled force field, almost as if you had built it in the first place. You remove it, casting it to the side, and you reach inside to deactivate the crystals that power both the pulse and the pedestal. As you remove them, a scaly hand falls on your shoulder. Your head whips around, and you see only the inky blackness of a piscine eye. Well, that's kind of creepy. The memory begins to fade, as if you were being drawn backward through a tunnel, and you hear more pylons rising from the pit. Something is wrong. The events within the orb have settled into that gap in your mind, but the edges of it are rough, as though the memory itself is not truly yours. There's something else. A gust of sour air pulling at you, like a predator inhaling the scent of its prey at the far end of a dark, whispering field. So we're having somebody else's strange memories. I love these rippling waves of these things. It's pretty cool. It's all very mysterious. Alright, what's the next one? You stand beside a woman on a verdant crag. Beneath the two of you is a broad plateau towering above the overgrowth far below. Strange machines have been built into the cliffside, presumably for reconnaissance or defense. A metallic disc gleams from the center of the plateau. Your self-aware humanoid machines drill into the base of the cliffs below. If you were looking for a sanctuary, and you were, desperately, this seems like the right place. I don't know about this. The woman says, her voice flat, neutral. Her face is turned away from you. What makes this place any more secure than the other ones we've found? 
I can draw our attention to the hidden details that my experienced eye can see. I can use my charm to persuade her of the merits of the site and remind her of the time constraints, or I can convince her with the wisdom of a superior intellect. I'm going to use my charm to persuade her. A cloud passes over the sun as you engage her in spirited, friendly debate, pointing out the footprint of a prior world civilization whose power remains untapped. After a few minutes, she laughs, raising her hands in mock surrender. Stop! Stop! Your servitors are down there. You've already chosen this as the site, haven't you? She waits for your affirmation and says, All right, I'm convinced. The two of you sketch your plans for the sanctuary, drawing schematics and architectural diagrams. Then you descend onto the plateau to examine the open ground. The woman suggests having one of the servitors build a shelter for your time here. You try to draw one of the constructs away from its task, but it does not respond to your voice. When you lay a hand on its shoulder to reinforce your command, it whirls and strikes you across the face with inhuman speed. It turns back to its task, ignoring you. Your companion helps you rise, laughter in her eyes. It seems your construct has other ideas. What's the matter with it? I can use the Numenera integrated into the construct's body to overwhelm the behavior malfunction. I can examine it for mechanical faults, or I can look for a deeper solution. Perhaps it's an effect of the metallic disc itself. I think I will look for a deeper solution. A mist falls onto the plateau as you wrap a fiber shielding mesh around the construct's skull. The mesh powers up, protecting the construct's mind from any trans-dimensional emissions that might be in the area. Taking a deep breath, you repeat your command. Acknowledged. It obediently trundles. Trundles! That's one of my favorite words! Trundle hype! Whenever I read the Lone Wolf books, about those Joe Deaver Lone Wolf books, every once in a while he uses the word trundles, and it always amuses me so much. We got some trundling taking place. It obediently trundles to the side of your new shelter. The image freezes, then fades, and you feel the memory filling the gap in your mind, block by jagged block. You stagger, clutching your head, reclaiming your memories hurts. And once more, there's something else. Hairs lift one by one on the back of your neck. Something beyond this room can sense what you are doing and is hunting you. Well, that sounds ominous. And the floor changes itself again. I think we've got one more memory here. Somebody's memories. Whoever cast us off, apparently, for a cast off. A vision of a city springs up around you, your city, in flames and under attack. Her defenders have fought and died all day, and still the attackers keep coming. They fight as if your destruction were demanded of them. They care nothing for mercy, surrender, or plunder. What they want is blood. But you have brought a keen-eyed companion to the top of the tower. She has seen the way to stop the invaders. You need to get her to safety, and you need to rally your defenders. But even as you turn toward the door of the tower, two of the attackers descend from a hovering machine. You don't have time to strike at them before they land. One is brutishly large, his weapon a vibrating axe. The other is slim, sheathed in glassy armor, and holding a hilt with a sizzling, invisible blade. Your companion backs away. She's too young to help. Your enemies advance single file, confined by the parapet. I can trade blows with the giant, and handle it for at least a strike or two. Duck under the giant's swing and attack before you can strike. Or fight defensively and figure out who presents the greater threat. I'm going to do number three there. The memory seems crystal clear. The giant is menacing, it's true but the invisible blade of his companion is more worrisome still. 
The energy field that flickers and wavers around it suggests that she can carve matter at the molecular level, tearing pieces of her target into nothingness. If you're to save yourself, your best bet is to tackle her first. She's stuck behind the giant, waiting her turn to attack you, unable to bring her weapon to bear until he's out of the way. But it's clear that she expects him to handle you, and her eyes rove behind you, her focus on your ward. She's clearly, no, she's certainly not expecting you to dive between the giant's legs and come up inside her guard. She can't bring her blade to bear in time, and you drive your dagger up under her chin. Well, that suddenly got violent. You catch her before her deadly blade drops onto you and spin her around. The weapon slashes into the giant, and he topples, bisected. You know, it's always good to start things off by bisecting someone. The immediate threat ended. You focus on finding a way back to your allies. You open the tower door and rush down the stairs. The door at the base of the stairs is slightly cracked, opening just a bit into the hall, and you hear more of the enemy soldiers beyond. I can hurl myself against the door and knock them to the ground. I can crack the door open to sneak past them, or I can charge through them, counting on my defenses to protect me. We're going to crack the door open to sneak past. We're going for a more of a subtle, sneaky type of character here, I think. You press yourself against the gleaming door, easing it open, and your breath catches in your throat as it squeaks quietly, a sound like a bell in your memory. You pause, but the soldiers in the hall continue to talk. You push again, squeeze yourself through the narrow opening, and creep down the blood-stained hall. Hey, Boss Pie. How you doing? Good to see ya. The memory begins to fade, and you find yourself back in your own body. Your temples throb with the racing force of your heartbeat, and the reclaimed memories blaze within you like a bonfire on a mountain peak, visible to every predator for kilometers around. A tremor rocks the floor beneath you, as though a massive fist has struck the room itself. Swaying on your feet, you see frantic movement within the borders of a mirror at the edge of the room. And the path to the mirror is now revealed to us. I'm doing pretty good, Boss Pie. Thanks. Glad to hear, glad to hear you're doing alright. Let's go see what's up with this mirror. The border of this mirror is lavishly decorated with a dizzying number of interlocked symbols. Daggers, masks, paintbrushes, amulets, and more. But that's nothing compared to what you see in the glass. You see a vast crowd of people, exact doppelgangers of you, shoving, arguing with, and fighting each other. Most are drab imitations of you, but a precious few are vivid and pull at your attention. Each of them bears an intricate pentagonal tattoo on their head. In their eyes, their actions, you see the memories you discovered within the orbs and the choices you made, shining like distant stars. Your hand twitches at your side, and though some of the bright doppelgangers ignore you, an even smaller number immediately turn to you, waiting for you to choose them and learn what you might become. A rumble shakes the room, and a slow vibration spreads from the darkness below, rippling toward the ceiling. So something is definitely going wrong in this place. Hey, White Balls 1987! How you doing? How is this? Well, I've just barely, barely started, but uh, so far, I like it. I think it's going to be really good. Alright, let's point at the doppelganger with a charming smile. The doppelganger swaggers out of the crowd. Speaking in a warm, sincere voice, it tells you an outrageous story punctuated with confidential asides, emphatic gestures, and twists that defy your every expectation. Though you're almost certain this tale is packed with lies, you'd be hard-pressed to separate them from the truth. 
The doppelganger finishes its story with a flourish and waits for your decision. I want to consider the other choices. Let's point at the doppelganger with the clever eyes. Doppelganger makes its way over to you. It's about to speak when a thuggish figure charges over the crowd and shakes his knife in the doppelganger's face. Speaking in your voice, the doppelganger raises a calming hand, appealing to the thug's better nature with a combination of disarming wit and outright lies. Scowling, the thug lowers his knife and apologizes to the doppelganger for the trouble. Doppelganger turns to you, waiting for your decision. I want to consider the other choices. Let's point at the slick doppelganger that's smooth-talking the others. With a roguish grin, the doppelganger drops a few pilfered coins and makes its way over to you, slipping a dagger from a hidden sheath on its wrist. It flicks the dagger high into the air. Winking at you, it catches the weapon by the blade between its thumb and forefinger and whips it at your head. You nearly duck before realizing the dagger is still in its hand. At your reaction, the doppelganger apologizes so smoothly, you forget you were even mad. The doppelganger spins the dagger back into its sheath and waits for your decision. I want to consider the other choices. What about the doppelganger moving stealthily through the crowd? You blink, and the doppelganger is gone. So you think at first, for you can hear, just for a second, a low chuckle somewhere behind you. When you finally blink, it stands before you once more, behind the glass where it belongs, and waiting for your decision. I want to consider the other choices, and there's one last one here. These are my options based on the decisions I made in the memories. The strong-willed doppelganger. It reaches the other side of the mirror and touches its side of the glass. The surface blurs and a vision unfolds before you. Hey, Nox, good to see ya. Welcome, Nox. You just missed trundling. The word trundles was used in this just, just a few minutes ago. You missed out. How's it going, Nox? The doppelganger is shackled at the center of a vast arena, beneath the hulking shadow of an executioner. Unbowed by the jeers of the savage audience, the doppelganger speaks forcefully, frighteningly, of what will come after its death and the consequences thereof. The mob shouting dies, one voice at a time. Then, in perfect silence, the doppelganger meets the executioner's eyes. Trembling, the brute swings his axe and severs the doppelganger's chains, setting it free. The arena fades away, replaced by the squabbling group. The strong-willed doppelganger lowers its hand and awaits your decision, its chin high and proud. I want to consider the other choices. Alright, well I have to decide which one of these I want to be, basically. Uh, this will give me my descriptor, which affects some of my abilities and stuff. You were too busy trundling away from the work, demons? That's good, I'm glad you escaped, yet again. Let's just go with, uh... The charming one. Yes, that is who I am. I'm doing pretty well, thanks. Thanks, Nox. The remaining doppelgangers scatter for the edge of the mirror and vanish. Your chosen identity steps forward. Its appearance changes as it steps out of the rippling glass. Its face reflects confidence and cleverness. Shadows of weapons flicker in and out of its hand, and a few devices shimmer on its belt. You get the feeling it, you, would be comfortable in a variety of situations. The word Jack sounds in your mind. Jack is one of the three classes. They're not called classes, they're called types in Numenera, but they're classes. There's three of them, Jack, Glaive, and Nano, which are basically, Jack is like Rogue, or Jack of all trades, got, you know, like Rogue Bard, kind of got a little bit of fighter stuff and a little bit of mage stuff. Glaive is a, is a fighter, and Nano is basically a mage, so to speak. 
Even though the setting technically doesn't have magic per se, it has all this advanced technological stuff that's so that's so beyond anything we can possibly understand that it's functionally magic. Game descriptor charming. Your doppelganger continues walking, stepping into you, filling you, making you whole. Your decision rings out in the cavernous room, awakening and unlocking vast mechanisms behind the walls. Suddenly, a grotesque noise rings through your shared worlds, like a bell if bells could rot. Something is coming, like a bell if bells could rot. That, uh, sounds ominous. The mirror fades, leaving a dark, open doorway. You take a deep breath and step through. Alright, now we're at legit character creation. 45 minutes into this. <laughs> your choices and the memories in the mirror have begun to build your character, but now you have the opportunity to decide on a number of details. First, you can decide to change your type. Type defines the abilities and skills you'll be able to acquire as you advance. Alright. So there's three character types we can choose between. Right now it's got me as a Jack. It says... It reads... Jacks are intrepid explorers and adventurers. They are jacks of all trades, hence the name. Although the world also harkens back to fables involving a wily, resourceful hero who always seems to be named Jack. Jacks are at their best when they combine weapons, armor, esoteries... That's like spells ciphers and a clever tongue they're treasure hunters grifters skulls rogues and experts in a variety of fields if i choose jack i get this flex skill which choose one exploration lore or conversation skill plus one training level in that skill while active till next sleep so basically once a day i get to just pick a skill to be trained in for the duration of that day any skill which is pretty freaking good I get four points to distribute to any pool. These are my three pools right here. Might speed intellect. Three health at tier one, six health at each later tier. Gain two abilities at tier one, one ability at each later tier, and I can pick an exploration skill at each tier. So that's the jack. Then there's the glaive. And you can see there's a little change to my appearance over here with the gear. The glaive's got like more heavier armor kind of stuff going on. Glaives are the elite warriors of the Ninth World, using weapons and armor to fight their enemies. Scouts, guardians, warlords, and soldiers could be glaives. Most glaives either have a high might and use the heaviest armor and weapons available, or a high speed and stick with light or ranged weapons and light or medium armor. They get opportunist. It ends your turn immediately. You make a basic attack against the first enemy that moves within range and gain 15% to hit on that. That's pretty cool. And you get practiced in armor. You get a reduction to the penalty that you'd normally get to speed and might for wearing armor, which is cool. Plus one might and speed pool, that's that's why those and plus two more extra points to distribute. Five health at one, seven at each other. So five and seven, this was three and six. So you see obviously the glaives get more health than jacks do. You pick a weapon skill at each tier, get an ability at each tier and an athletic skill at tier 1. And then there's the Nano. Nanos are sometimes called mages, wizards, sorcerers, or witches by the people of the Ninth World. Whatever they're called, Nanos master the mysteries of the past to the degree that they seem to perform miracles using esoteries, spell-like invocations... Spell-like invitations! You, would you like to come to lunch? Would you like to come to lunch? How about you, brunch? Would you like... How about my wedding? I've got all sorts of invitations to give out. Now, spell-like invocations that combine gestures, command words, and psychic disciplines. They tap into nano-spirits, numinous particles that suffuse the landscape to alter reality or learn things that they couldn't otherwise know. They get a concentration increase, so plus one of the concentration skill. They get a cipher limit increase, so just for being a nano, a nano, you can carry an extra cipher. And then they get an onslaught, which is like a damage spell. It costs one intellect to use it. But you choose a damage type, you deal five damage to that type, and confer a minor additional effect based on the choice. 
They get two to their intellect pool, two more points for anything. Only five health, so they get no extra health at first level. So they only have 20 instead of 23 or 25, and then they get five per, so they have the weakest health, as you would expect from a wizard type. They gain two abilities at each tier, though, which is more than anyone else. And you can pick a lore skill at tier one. Um, and then I have Deception and Persuasion here because I have the Charming Descriptor. And I also have a penalty on Heavy Weapons because of the Charming Descriptor. So if I, if I, I'm not going to pick a Glaive, actually. I'm not going to be a Glaive. Stat pools are the resources you use to apply effort or activate abilities. You can distribute points as you see fit. Glaives tend to favor might and or speed, while nanners favor intellect. Jacks usually benefit from a balanced set of points. So if I was a glaive, I'd put like a couple points in might or whatever. You've got your three. Might is your character's physical strength and resilience. Each point of might also increases health by one. Speed represents the character's dexterity and reaction times. Every two points in speed also increases evasion by 5%, which is your defense against uh, weapon attacks. Intellect represents your mental prowess, willpower, and personality. Every two points in that also increases willpower by 5%, which is basically your defense against magic attacks. Or, you know, the equivalent of magic. Abilities unlocked by your type can be active actions, such as attacks or spell-like esoteries, or unique passive effects. So if I picked a glaive, these are the abilities I could choose from, and I can only choose one. Extra crit chance on weapon attacks, extra evasion and willpower to de defend myself, uh, forces a target to attack me, costs an intellect point, or snares a target with a grappling hook and pulls him towards you. So kind of tanky stuff for the glaive. And then I'd also get... Most skills increase your chance of success on specific kinds of actions and tasks, but some give other passive bonuses. Each skill starts at the novice level, can be increased to trained, and then specialized, granting greater bonuses at each level. The scriptors often leave some skills at the inability level, which is where they have the two red dots, meaning they inflict penalties. When upgraded, these return to the novice level. So then I get to choose one of these skills, Smashing, Quick Fingers, Endurance, or Running. You know, so Endurance gives me extra health, say. And then those weapon skills, which increase a character's chance to hit with specific kinds of weapons. Like other skills, they start at Novice and can be upgraded to train and specialize. Only Glaives get weapon skills. I mean, there might be other ways for like a Jack to get a weapon skill or something, but like you get, them, you get one every level for free as a Glaive. Jackson nanos don't. So if I wanted to do heavy weapons, you know, I could put one in there. And then I can change my descriptor if I want. Like, I already picked Charming, but now it'll let me choose any one I want if I want to change it. Although you chose your descriptor from among the many doppelgangers in the mirror, you now have the chance to view the specific bonuses and penalties it grants. You can also examine the effects of other descriptors and choose a new one if you wish. So as you can see, there's a lot of different descriptors. You only get one. And each one gives you different um, different starting skills. And some of them give you a little extra points in one of your pools. And some of them give you other stuff like plus to resistance or plus to, uh, plus to might, plus to willpower, plus to speed, plus to armor. So there's lots of those. So anyway, I'm not going to be a glaive though. Really what it comes down to is I have to decide between Jack and Nano. Because I really want things from both of those, and I don't know which one I want more. As a Jack, I get more skills, and I want to have some good skills. As a Jack, I get... We well, you know what, let's go through Jacks and Nanos in our next episode. If you're watching the stream, I am not even remotely close to stopping. I'm going to keep going for a long time. I've got copies of the game to give away in a little while. But uh, if you're watching on YouTube, that's going to bring this first episode to an end. 
So thank you for watching. This has been Josiah Plays Torment Tides of Numenera.